Great. This is week three, and our headline is uh, how to sell wine to customer to your customers that they've never heard of. We've spent the last couple of weeks with Igor. We discussed uh, life under lockdown in Italy when it was all a very new thing to to us here in the UK. Last week we talked about the sustainability efforts that Amphi have gone to to make them the first winery in the world to be certified sustainable uh, and everything else. And then this week, we are gonna go through the less obvious wines or a number of less obvious wines. We've got a panel of experts joining us to kind of give a different spin on the wines that we're looking at and how we would discuss them with our customers. So with no further ado, let me introduce first, uh, obviously, we've met Igor. Let's do him again. The thing that I didn't get to say last week, but I definitely said in the first week, is he was the most charming sommelier of the year in Italy back in 2008. So yeah, yeah long ago, long ago. to get old and bitter, and that's my joke. <laughs> I think that's continuing, but you know, it, it's Groundhog Day for all of us. Um, Igor, introduce yourself, please, quickly. <laughs> So uh, very quickly, I just represent Banfi. I'm a wine lover and that's it. I travel all around Europe to try to represent and to uh, communicate Banfi wines to people like you. So that's it, easy. There we go. So from one old sommelier to a, to a young one. Next, we've got <laughs> Stefan Neumann from uh, the Mandarin Oriental, or should it be Stefan Neumann MS. Uh, Stefan, tell us about yeah, yourself. What, what what would to say about me? Um, I'm like Igor, as so many. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm as charming as Igor. I still need to work on the beard, but you know I may get there one day. Uh, but your work is uh, the official title. It makes me sound very old. It's director of wine for um, Mandarin Rentals, and particular one restaurant which is called Dinner by Heston Blumenthal. So a two star within Knightsbridge within Mandarin Rental. Um, the symbol of focus of selling good wine. Well, there we go. <laughs> it's easy, and the charming thing is. It's overrated if it's Igor. Um, sorry. And then finally, um, we are, we've got a, an expert in independent retail. Uh, we've got Julia from Flagship Wines. Julia. Hi, everybody. Uh, I own and run as managing director Flagship Wines, which is an independent wine merchant based in St. Albans. Uh, focusing online with uh, deliveries and uh, click and collect at the moment, normally including some wholesaling, retail and online. So great to be here. Great. Thank you. So hopefully we've got some different viewpoints um, to share with you and we're, we're going to frame it kind of wine by wine. So the first wine that we are going to look at is one called La Cotegola which isn't one of the ones that's easy to pronounce, which is a point we'll come to later. Um, and before we start discussing it, Igor, do you want to just talk about the wine? Yeah, La Pettigola is a Vermentino pure coming from the, Tusk, the Tuscan coast. So in a very warm, hot climate. It is, uh, uh, Vermentino is now a booming grape variety in Italy and becoming hopefully quite popular all over the world. Is the Vermentino is popular from Sardinia Island, but also from Liguria and Tuscany is the three regions in Italy where this grape is mostly cultivated. And then uh, the characteristic is to be very aromatic in the nose with nice flowery and sage and grapefruit uh, aromas, but quite, uh, let's say, powerful and full body and the mouth because it's coming from a warm climate, so very creamy, uh, fat, nice uh, personality. And the name is also quite easy, that's why it's a selling point in Italy, but maybe not that strong all over the world. The La Petegola is the name of the little bird on the label, but also in Italy that means they are kind of a gossip, a chatty lady, uh, uh, the girl in the little village that knows everything about everybody. So the style of the wine wants to be, let's say, quite close to the, the style of the name, in a positive way, of course. So that's, that's it. It's a note, it's very fresh, it's uh, no barrel aging, so resulting usually a nice combination between power and freshness. Great. Thank you, Igor. So, um, Vermentino, Stefan, mm -hmm. in a restaurant environment, 
I suppose the first question is, how familiar do you find your customers with a variety like Vermentino? And how would you kind of talk to them about it and, and get them on the hook? Well, I think you know, it's, a, it's a variety which is, which is more well known than it was before. I still think there's a lot of work which needs to be done with Fermentino and people hear more and more about it. You know, and I think uh, guests, customers who like aromatic uh, styles of wine, they really will enjoy Fermentino. And um, I think, you know, what the, what the great quality of it is that it has always quite a texture element. Um, as Igor said, then it's from a quite warm area. And for me, the way I get normally people talking about this is I just try to take them to that place. So I, I cheekily printed out a picture and just to show this to everyone. <laughs> this this is how beautiful Marema is. No? And you know, I think you know when you when you're in the restaurant and I work I work in London, you know, I look out of the window and ninety percent of the time it's pretty miserable out there and it's it's rainy, it's cloudy, it's it's muggy. So you want to take them to this place. You know, you talk about the sunny Italy and maybe they have for me personally when I look at this picture, it always reminds me of other places in Italy. Like when I go to Venice, you know, when I um, um, when I see this sort of colored houses, so I try to take them there where the sun is really, and then I talk about that this is an aromatic, fresh fruit cream style. Um, I think you know the, the strong suit of this variety lies that you can pair it with so many different dishes. You know, seafood is just being one of them. You know, but if you have some octopus, you know, that works really well. And I think you know, especially when you when you talk to a guest about a wine they've never heard about, it, it's it's trying to find something which they can compare it to. At the same time, this means as well, from, from a restaurant point of view, you need to tell them, um, you need to tell your staff first, you know, you need to, to tell uh, everyone who's working in the restaurant, okay, guys, you know, this is now Fermentino, we do it now by the glass. Um, for us, for example, no matter which wine we do by the glass, we give every guest a try just to make sure they like it. So mm -hmm. we tell them, we tell the staff first, you know, and then, of course, you need to have the right timing, you know. So for me, Fermentino is a variety which I would introduce now in the summertime, you know, I would do this now in... June, July, August, where, they, where it's warm out there, you know. Uh, you don't, uh, I think a wine like this needs, needs uh, the right time to be launched and on the right time to be presented in the restaurant. And, you know, for me, then it's a pretty self-selling thing. You know, you, you teach your stuff, first of all. You, you let them uh, taste. You take them to your place with your imagination, with uh, your colorful, wonderful words and uh, tell them how, how beautiful Italy is. And it's not difficult, as I said, if you, if you sit in the rainy UK. Uh, and that's it, you know, so it's like it's, it's trying to find a few selling points and trying to compare them to international varieties, you know. And as I said, you know, if, if people like Sauvignon, if people like Riesling, um, you know, if people like Rune Vedlina, so there's, there's so many options you can compare it to. Yeah, thanks. As, I mean, as, I think the point about giving people kind of points of reference and kind of making sure your staff are trained up on it is a really key one that I, I suspect will revisit. Is that if your staff really understand what the wine is and what it's similar to, you know, introducing that new idea to a customer, if they can provide a point of reference, I think is a, is a really good one. And a quick question, do your staff need to sit through your holiday snaps uh, every time you come home? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 um, right, so Julia, kind of your spin kind of on an independent retail side of things, obviously you've got a slightly different interaction with your customers. Yeah, we do. But it does build on the same building blocks really, to give people confidence, you know, to make a purchasing decision um, of a wine that uh, may not have um, come across before. So, um, you know, Vermentino is relatively new on the uh, UK retail sort of shelves, um, something that's sort of gaining a little bit more shelf space, you know, with a variety of styles of wine being produced as well. And as Igor was saying, you know, this one has sort of lovely texture, very fresh, um, and um, can be offered, you know, for people to enjoy and um, multiple multiple uses um, at time and um, it's something that uh, when people are looking for an alternative wine rather than specifically asking us for um, you know a Vermentino at the moment we're able to offer this you know and it can put it in the same category as perhaps a Gideo it's an alternative to Sauvignon um, to Pinot you know which um, a few years ago that you know Viognier and we're all sort of quite new and quite friendly. So it's great to have some alternatives of, you know, sort of really well-made wines. It's a name that perhaps they might come across in blends if they're curious about what they're drinking at, at the lower level of the market, but they bear no resemblance to, you know, some of the sort of individual wines such as uh, the Banffy, um, 
Valentino. So it's uh, it's something where if you can gain people's confidence, you know, in terms of giving them reference points. Of, well, if you like this, then you know it's very similar. Um, great if you want to drink it with X, Y, Z. You know, they quite often come to us with field plans that they want to match some wines to, or recipes and things like this. So it gives us a bit of fun. And we have blackboards in the shop with recipes and wine serving suggestions. So yeah, we put ideas in people's minds, and um, I think uh, you know to um, be able to sort of say, well, you know, this comes from the part of Italy. Some people being on holiday there, so they start relating um, to the product and you know, it becomes uh, slightly easier and a softer sell to introduce people to something. Yeah. Great. No, thanks, Julia. And Igor, one of the things you were saying um, was that Vermentino is a variety that's more and more popular in Italy. Um, a question I suppose I've got for you on a kind of international scale is that if people are after a Vermentino, how would you make the, the Banfi Vermentino stand out from the others that might be available to them? We are, uh, let's say, now pushing a lot of Vermentino because it's uh, mainly a native grey variety from Italy that was not discovered yet in many countries in the world. So that's why it's becoming quite popular. And being Banfi, uh, mainly producing uh, red wines, 80 and plus percent, you know, having an autochthon, a native grape variety in our portfolio, in our territory, able to uh, satisfy all of the demands of those kind of Sauvignon or semi-aromatic style of wines uh, like Alberino is for us just covering a gap between what we were doing just a few years ago, 10, 10 years ago. So Vermentino now is, the, the task on Vermentino, our Vermentino is uh, very easy going, as Stefan said, is quite sweet. It, the, the, the beautiful uh, springtime or summertime is a terrace wine. is really reminding to the beauty of Tuscany in a white way and not only in a red. And, you know, Tuscany is famous for the reds, but not that much for the whites. And that's a very, very nice selling point also for those partners of ours who, who need to, let's say, uh, make their portfolio bigger and well, at least complete with something else but red wines. Great. Thank you very much. So I think that's um, wrapped up the Vermentino. I'm kind of slightly conscious of time, but I think that covered a lot of the ground that we'll cover for all of them. Um, the next wine is one that I thought was going to be a harder one to discuss, uh, but actually on our kind of, when we had a conversation yesterday, it was the one that I think had the most animated discussion, and that's the Fontanelli. Is that right, Igor? Fontanelle. There we go. Uh, Chardonnay. Uh, Igor, do you want to tell us about this briefly first? So, uh, Fontanelle Chardonnay is the most tricky wine to talk about today, probably, because it's a Chardonnay, it's a French grape coming from a very famous and classic region like Tuscany for red wines. So that's why it probably is not that easy to sell this wine. But as probably some of you already experimented, it's going into a kind of a wine category that for us is absolutely important. So it's a very niche of our production, it's a wonderful high quality wine. And so when we planted and first vintage produced 82, we commercialized Fontanelle, we were quite, uh, let's say, proud of doing a super premium for Chardonnay. So why doing a regular or a mass production Chardonnay to compete with the whole world instead of doing a super fantastic high quality Chardonnay just for lovers. So in the end, this is covering once again the gap with the white and the reds in Tuscany. And it was a madness to produce Chardonnay in the Montalcino area just 40 years ago. So we were believing in the fact that to make a wine like this, we should have done a Burgundy style Chardonnay, but costing like an Italian Chardonnay. And this is indeed probably the secret of success of this wine. We are used to allocate uh, Chardonnay all over the world because it's not enough, our production, to cover the demand. And that's quite good. But in the end, what probably we need to, to go deeper into you know, this conversation is that uh, Chardonnay is maybe covering an even better 
uh, covering expectations. So it's maybe for all of us, expectations is a, is a key for selling wine. So if you expect 100 and you get 99, you will never be satisfied. But if your expectations are not that high from a Chardonnay coming from Italy, and then you tried and you are more than happy with the result of your tasting, probably that will be your wine, you know, and for both the quality profile, and the tasting profile and the price range. So this is more or less what we mean in the production of Fontanelle and Chardonnay. And the result of, of sales is pretty good because of that. So potentially a weird wine, right wine from a, a Tuscan famous red region, but covering all the expectations. Great. I think one of the things about, you know, all of us who enjoy wine is, is finding unexpectedly good wines. I'm not sure if that's the, the, the right way of putting it, but kind of these small discoveries and then communicating those to, to, to the people or introducing them to people. Um, I think you're right. The biggest challenge is Chardonnay is a very congested variety or sector and I suppose um, Julia how in kind of your in your shop would you introduce this and what are the challenges and how do you overcome them? Well you're absolutely right to say that you know there is a challenge with Chardonnay because you know it's such a ubiquitous great variety grown in so many parts of the world. Um, it does have a distinctive style albeit you know there are some Chardonnays uh, produced you'd be hard pushed to say, you know, perhaps where they, where they originated. And I always like to find wines that have got a sense of provenance, um, regardless of, you know, great variety and um, how they're made. Um, in terms of an Italian Chardonnay, I think as I uh, started to say yesterday then, it's great to find one, um, not only, you know, has some polish and is well made, but also does have that little sense of, you know, being Italian, uh, with a little, um, just a citrusy twist on, uh, with minerality on it um and a hint of um a texture which isn't always there with others and i think you know we get a lot of people who say they don't like chardonnay and we have to break that down especially when you're trying to recommend something to go with a certain dish um or they want an italian white wine and they just say no i'm not gonna have that i'll have that then it's actually an opportunity to you know introduce them to something that doesn't have you know the um sort of richness that uh, they might have in the back of their mind having too much of the uh, you know the, the Aussie sort of Chardonnays in the days when they were sort of the bigger style of it they're not um, now and many are seeking sort of a little bit more finesse on them um, and I think we tend to um, display um, by country and so we can introduce them steadily people are not sort of introduced to a whole raft of, of Chardonnays from around the world and I think sometimes that can be quite daunting um, albeit you know we can put them in price order or whatever um, I think it's, it's um, you know, that we can sort of start off either with great variety or with the fact that um, it's a fancy Italian wine. So we can then, you know, steer people in, in the direction so they can make a, a selection. Um, and again, it's based on giving them confidence to, you know, perhaps try something that they haven't thought of. You know, people don't automatically think of Chardonnay from, um, you know, a producer like Banffy. So I think, uh, uh, yeah, that's our, our sort of start point and, and relating it to the reason why they want to buy a wine of that ilk um, and style. I mean, I think you're, you're right. I think the Chardonnay, especially the, the Banffy Chardonnay, it does have that sense of place that we always talk about when we're talking about any wine, really. Uh, and the fact that it is a, a premium Chardonnay really you know, draws people away from that expectation. I mean, it's, I, I fear Italy kind of falls into that category of people think they'll throw in a thing in a vat and make some wine if it's, if it's going to sell. But actually, so many quality producers are there that are creating really beautiful examples. I think that's right, Eagle. Um, anyway, Stefan, you know, we were talking about your burgundy list yesterday at some length. But the most interesting bit about it was a bit below. Do you want to kind of talk to us about how this would fit? Yeah, yes. I mean, um, Iga made a very, very good point. You know, people always, when they hear Chardonnay, there's always the initial comparison to Burgundy. And, you know, you can see this as a disadvantage or as an advantage. I personally see it more as an advantage, you know, because you need to make this work in your favor. So what I do, I uh, have two pages on my, on my wine list about white Burgundy. And there are as I'm Austrian, quite Germanic organized, so north to south, I have my Chablis, I have my Chassan, I have my Pouligny, I have my Krankrus, and so on. 
But on the second page, just on the bottom, I put sort of something which is not so organized in terms of the region, but just in terms of price. So what I write here is um, the best Chardonnays from around the world. And then uh, Hyperfin giving the Burgundians a run for their money. And for me, this starts like with 40 pounds and goes up to 500. And this is then not organized in any way by, by region. It's organized purely by price. But this actually sparks the interest in customers saying, okay, uh, well, we had this wonderful Shazan, you know, I was 17, maybe a bit young, you know, I want to spend the same amount of money. What else you can recommend? And it makes my life and the life of all of my sommeliers, which is now eight, significantly easier because that sometimes they don't even need to flip that page. They're on the same page and saying, okay, why don't you discover something from here? And, you know, I think you need to make Chardonnay work in your, in your favor by saying, okay, it comes from an area in Italy. You may have heard about Cardinale de Montalcino and said, ah, oh, that doesn't sound very classic that Chardonnay is coming from Montalcino. And then you could say, well, actually the Italians thought about this. So they created sort of a small DOC within Brunello, which is called San Antonio, where you can produce not uh, uh, Sangiovese based wines, so international uh, varieties. And then you could say, you know, for me, this is, for example, important. I try to find a story to that wine. And uh, because I work for Mandarin, which is an Asian hotel group, you know, I have a lot of Asian customers. So they love to hear about history. So I tell them, okay, Banfi was established 1919. So it's uh, 100 years old. So, and suddenly they're like, oh, wow, they're doing this already 100 years. And you're like, yeah, that sort of works. So it's your angle you choose for me. And, you know, you need to make this work in your favor. So if they get that interest in saying, okay, this is from Tuscany, I heard about Brunello before, or this is a very well-established company, they're 100 years around or 101 years around. Um, so it works for you. You know, so it's like, as I said, try to find your angle and make it work in your favor. No, I think the this, this storytelling aspect of kind of almost all of these wines is what draws people in. And it's using that, small window of time you've got with someone to make a recommendation and appealing to what is and, and reading them and appealing to what is going to, to, to and, and i think you've got a good point with appealing because when i put the bottle up here so when you when you see the bottle you may not can see it on the screen but it's got a premium feel to it you know so it's like the, the little wax seal which is here so it feels premium now that's another thing you know you can talk about the the best wine in the world but it doesn't look premium and it doesn't feel premium there's no point in doing it so no? so it needs to sort of convince convince on the table as well yeah absolutely um so fair moving i think moving on any other points on this rosa uh, the fontanelli from r4 no 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 great so moving on to the rosa de montalcino um, or as I like to think of it, the kind of rustic baby Brunello. Um, I was telling Stefan and Julia this yesterday, and Stefan insisted I share it please, with you lot. Please share that story, it's amazing. Before, before the lockdown, I did a, a journey down to Devon, uh, but I've got three kids, three sons, and whenever we go anywhere, we've got bikes on the back, we've got rugby balls, we've got footballs, we, the, the car is, every available space is taken. But what it means is when you've got wine, you've got to shove it in as well. And it gets shoved under seats. It's, you know, my parents used to take us on holiday in the same way and things would just get shoved in all kinds of spaces. And the good thing is I was driving around the other day and I heard this clinking. And I'm pleased to say, I mean, this is how much I enjoy this. I have a stash of it in my car. So this <laughs> has come to me on lockdown and I will be enjoying it soon as well. So it really is a great wine. And, you know, if I, that doesn't sell it to you, I don't know what does, what will. But um, on a, maybe on a more serious uh, approach, Igor, why don't you just tell us briefly about the um, the Rosso de Montalcino? Yeah, it, it, it's great because just following your your concept, it, it, I used to say in the end of my speeches, but Rosso de Montalcino is actually my favorite wine in in Banfi portfolio. I shouldn't say probably in the beginning. But it's really the wine I, I love to drink every day, to, lean, to drink with friends, uh, to drink anytime. is super eclectic, is incredible with food. And, you know, Italy is make, doing wine, using wine accordingly with food. So all of the regions you're going, uh, every little corner of Italy is about a new style of food, a new kind of wine. And all of them are matching absolutely great. So if you're coming down to Montalcino, all of the food you will have from the region 
will match perfectly with Rosso. But on the other side, it, we were headlining this, this uh, webinar, like uh, how to explain why it's your customer they never heard about. And probably they heard about Rosso because it's a, an appellation, it's from a classic region in Italy, but not everybody is aware about what Rosso is. And it's an incredible, uh, very difficult balance between the three main characteristics of Sanchovese. So being pale color, quite high acidic, and mostly high tannins. So the combination of these three important characteristics make Rosso di Montalcino incredibly good if it's balanced or sometimes harsh if it's not or if it's young or if you don't know it. So being harsh and tannic is absolutely mandatory for Rosso di Montalcino. It must be like that, otherwise it's not a Rosso di Montalcino. But these harsh uh, characteristics of, of, of the tasting profile make the wines incredibly good as a palate cleaner, as a mouth cleaner as a food matching. So whatever you put in your mouth will be completely cleaned up by, by Rosalie Montalcino and you're ready to eat and, and buy something else. So in the end, the secret of this wine is that probably it will never be that lovely uh, by itself at the first tasting, especially if it's cold temperature, but you will definitely finish a bottle, just two of you, when eating, so the, it's this is a quite important, you know, consideration. Once you are promoting the wine at the restaurant, while you are selling the wines without the food or by the glass, so to understand Rosso Montalcino is probably uh, the the first thing to do once you are approaching to this wine. So maybe Brunello is correct, but Brunello tends to be, as you said correctly, a little bit more mature and developed and smoother, complex. Why Rosso is the, let's say, rustic uh, teenager brother of Brunello. So resulting in all of those, you know, very uh, ambitious uh, <laughs> characteristics of a teenager. And so if you know it and you can manage, you will, get, you will get incredibly satisfied with that. So that's why it's important to understand. And also vintages can be quite important to, to be... To, to keep in consideration when Brunello is not that good, probably Rosso would be amazing. So it's a bargain as well. And so all of these together make Rosso di Montalcino a unique one. No, I think it's not surprising to me that if you had a favorite, it would be this one. And I yeah. You clearly love it. I clearly yeah. love it. I mean, and this is almost the problem that sometimes we have is that when you love a wine so much and you enjoy it so much, communicating that to your customers because it you know to me it's like it's, it's rosso it's delicious you should have it but actually you, sometimes you've got to put a bit more thought into it um who did we go to first last time julia so why don't we go stefan next because i know what julia is up to on the next one um stefan what uh, what do you think about the rosso de montalcino that's one of these um, styles of wines which I think needs a bit of explanation because uh, Igor mentioned it already and you know, also sort of with this baby Brunello and I think you know uh, the one thing which you really want to know about Rosso is it's a little bit of a vintage knowledge it's about knowing which vintage you want to buy for me the best example here I can give is like in 2014 uh, all these very wonderful journalists and uh, great wine writers they weren't so pleased with 2014 Brunellos you know, that's okay, you know, it's not everyone's taste. It's, it's a vintage which has to be proven quite difficult for Brunello. But that does mean your, your Rosso is just cracking value. You know, you buy, you buy a 14 Rosso and you buy a 15 Rosso, they couldn't be more different. It makes actually sense for a restaurant to list them as well because in the end of the day, you know, not everyone wants to spend a three-digit amount in a restaurant for a Brunello or 80, 90 quid. So it offers a great, great opportunity to have something which is Brunello-like maybe a more approachable style. And one very, very important thing maybe to mention for Rosso, and uh, Iga mentioned it, like with the uh, high acidity, that slightly uh, rustic tannins. For me, this is uh, a good example. Don't judge a book by its cover. You know, it's like it's, you need to uh, let that wine come to you first. You know, the thing is, when you have high acid wines, you taste them first, you need to give your palate a bit of a chance to adjust to all of this. And the best way of doing this as simple as it is, it's eating, you know, so you have something to eat with it and it's beautiful. Otherwise, if you have a bottle of Rosso by yourself or with someone, then you know, just give it one sip, give it another sip, and then 
it's really nice to see, especially in the bigger glass, how beautiful these wines open up. So I think for me, it represents good value. It's a unique style, which I can relate to something. And, you know, it's like something still for, for people to discover vintage by vintage. Yeah, I think, I think the idea and also kind of giving that nugget of information to your customers, being like, that was a bad Brunello, but you're going to get some top notch Rosso. Yeah, I'm thinking of that's value you know. It draws them into your knowledge, and you know they feel like they they're either getting a bargain or they're getting a kind of little bit of secret, you know, secret knowledge. And I think that really kind of helps win their confidence, which we were talking about earlier, and Julia was talking about earlier. I mean, Julia, with the the Rosso, how how are you finding it in retail? Is it a wine people keep coming back for? Quite an interesting wine. Um, it's definitely one that people need to have experienced in a. In a restaurant environment, I think, because as Stefan was saying, and you know, um, once people are aware of, of what it is and how it will taste, um, and, and actually have a glass board, it does evolve in the glass, and then you begin to appreciate it. And um, you know, particularly with particular styles of, of food, and if if you know the appeal to some people is the structure and the tightness of a of a wine, they don't necessarily want something that's appealing and soft. So you know, it does go to that, and we find that. It's a wine that's difficult to sell off the shelf unless people know that they're coming in and they see a Rosso de Montalcino on the shelf and they go, yes, I'm, you know, I, I know that wine, I'd like to have it. It is a hand sell, I think, in a retail environment. And we have introduced one or two at our annual wine fair and with a degree of success, actually, um, because once you know people are in the mood and they're having the opportunity to chat at leisure, with somebody who can really give them, you know, the finer points of the wine production, why it tastes as it does, then you know, they then buy one that they can actually sort of sit back and enjoy, you know, at home. Um, it's not quite such an easy one to, you know, introduce. Um, but it, it has a, it's on people's radar because of, you know, the relationship, if you like, with, with it and Brunello. So that, um, you know, the little brother concept is, is, a, is a good one. Um, and it's no less a wine for that. It just sort of establishes its niche and Know, it's you're able to you know get a, a reference point for, for people then to make a buying decision um so yeah it's uh, it's one that we don't sell huge quantities of but it's there and it, it turns over um yeah i think it's it is it's one of those wines that once it gets into people's wine world mm. it is always there and it's always intriguing um and i think you know having them at wine fairs and stuff especially when people are in the the moment the right mood. Yeah. yeah um great right so i think next up we'll go from tuscany up to piedmont igor is waving it um we've got the la luce which is uh the alborosa i'll let igor explain what it is and then i will do my analogy unless he pips me to it which i came up with yesterday which really tickled me but we'll come to it um Igor tell us about the La Luce from Piedmont. La Luce is the wine with the most uh, storytelling so in the backwards so probably uh, we, if we got time to spend with our customers or with our partners that would be the, the most uh, interesting to explain because it's so many things to say. First of all Alba Rosa is the grape itself so is a cross, is a genetic cross made 90 years ago in laboratory by a winemaker and enologist, Italian enologist, who was uh, crossing uh, Barbera and Nebbiolo together, kind of a, uh, to get the best from the both very famous uh, Piedmontese red varietals. So the, the, the son, the newborn, was Albarossa, so nothing with, to do with the parents, even though maybe the the, the color and the, the very inky, uh, beautiful color is very close to Barbera style, but it's not Nebbiolo and is and neither Barbera. So actually the Nebbiolo that was supposed to be the father was a kind of a specific Nebbiolo and that's another storytelling but very, very, let's say, geek <laughs> for uh, some geek sommeliers like, like me. So it was Chateau's, it was the, a nickname uh, Nebbiolo was the nickname given to Chateau's that was a native variety from Piedmont as well. So in the end, the result was an incredible, beautiful looking uh, wine with a deep, deep uh, purple color, which is in terms of expectations always 
100% of exploitation. So this is the one that always resulting in a tasting. And that's the reason why it's always succeeding. So if we can compare it with Rosso di Montalcino, they are the opposite, the North and the South Pole. So uh, Rosso di Montalcino is the classic movie. You can see uh, once uh, every second month, maybe, or in the quarantine, you are rediscovering the classic. But sooner or later, the classics are back. And the classic are classic because of that. So they will always survive. They are evergreens. So the La Luz is, it, is the new contemporary contemporary style, let's say a little bit more modern, but coming from the classics. So the roots of Albarossa is really into the classics, in Piedmontese varietals. And so it's a wine which is brand new, first vintage 2006, so only uh, 11 years produced by Banfi. And we were the first, together with other four producers, to plant Albarossa in Piedmont uh, a few years ago. So it was almost abandoned and the Piedmontese region was asking some producer to revitalize this grape variety because the potential was incredibly high. And so we took the challenge and we are now still keep on doing Albaros because the more we're doing and the better the wine is. So in 10 years, uh, we did, a, I remember, a vertical tasting at uh, London Wine Fair uh, 2019 and all of the vintage from 2006 up to 2016 were showing almost the same. So in 10 years time, the wine is keeping absolutely great. So potentially, this is a, a long aging uh, wine that can maybe get him better and better and developing quite well in the time, but unknown. So uh, uh, immediately you can realize how powerful the message from the loose can be. So a wonderful native grape variety, very niche with an incredibly good tasting profile and long aging potential. And finally, also an, an excellent uh, quality and, and price ratio. So the combination of all of these elements is making the loose incredibly successful. So probably from Julia's point of view would be a little bit more difficult to sell it on paper because nobody knows it. Nobody ever approached probably Alberosa in the world. But from maybe Stefan's point of view would be a little bit easier just to offering a sip or to make a tasting because as soon as you will try, you will fall in love with it. And this is what happened to Louis Latour Agency. You can maybe witness, maybe to Glenn as well in Gibraltar. I don't know. But anyway, these are wines that are always covering the expectation, and that's why they are so succeeding. I think, you know, the, the Rosso de Montalcino was actually clinking against De La Luz, so this is clearly another one that I quite like. Um, <laughs> but uh, what I was going to say is, um, very quickly, Igor, the, the packaging is vastly different to the rest of uh, the, the Banfrey range, which is obviously a bit more traditional. Um, yeah, you're right. In, indeed, the shape of the bottle, although looking like a modern shape, is a very old, uh, ancient bottle that was abandoned in Piedmont and was revitalized by Banfrey. So it's looking modern, but it's ancient. And the label as well is modern style because the grape variety is also quite young and Luz Albarossa is quite young. So let's say that we are mixing and matching the uh, traditional roots where uh, Luz was planted, Albarossa was planted with modern style that the wine is representing. So indeed, you're right, it's looking completely different than Rosso di Montalcino that is absolutely representing our traditional uh, territory and a very, very uh, old appellation in Italy. Um, and Julia, David, um, one of our colleagues, told me you're one of the first people to actually try the new vintage in the UK. Um, how, how do you find working with La Luz? Well, I think the um, first time I tried it was with David in store and it, we were just really sort of discussing um, the range that we would actually include in the wine for a few years ago, I think, David, wasn't that right? And uh, I tasted the La Luz and I just thought, what a fantastic opportunity to introduce something new of quality, um, but still with, as you've just been saying, very traditional roots. And it's that combination of temporary winemaking, which embraces, you know, tradition as well, um, that makes it actually quite an easy sell for us because we had a very, very positive uh, response at the time um, with, our, with our tastings. And then we followed it up. Um, obviously, you know, we had some sales from it and we included it in our um, pre-Christmas sort of wines to go with your 
you know, your festive um, meal sort of tastings and things. And um, again, you know, Alvarosa, well, what is it? You know, you, the, the name of the wine at, and La Luce, you know, it gives you your first opportunity to actually engage with people because they want to know what it is. It's a question. They don't know what Alvarosa is. So you can say, you know, Nebbiolo Barbera. Um, so they go, oh, I know those sort of great varieties, but then they try it and it's a completely different style. But it's very, very Italian. It's got a lovely, fresh, quite vibrant acidity um, and sort of, you know, sort of the cherries things, but it's actually tied together um, with some depth of flavour and some real character, a bit of structure. Um, and there's some nice sort of silky layers there as well. So, you know, you're getting something that's sort of um, got a point of, of difference, but equally, a reference point that people can relate to you know they know what they're looking for in um italian sort of red wines they, they have a raft and a wealth of you know perhaps experience of eating and enjoying italian food so you know it's that's it, the level of engagement in an independent and the beauty of it we can talk to our customers um because they come in um well i would guess 50 percent of the time looking for that level of engagement to introduce them to new things um, to always find what they'd expect to find on the shelf, but then to, you know, sort of go away perhaps with something that, uh, you know, they'd never have thought of um, before, certainly not something called La Luce or made from Alvarado from Monte, uh, where they're used to, you know, the Barberas and uh, Nebbiolos of this world. So, again, it's great value um, as well. It sits neatly for us um, amongst, you know, the range of um, other wines of, you know, we'd have some fabulous Barberas, for example, from sort of small wine originates and you know it's it's actually sort of adding a little bit of to um our italian red there i mean i think you're right it's kind of it's an opportunity to kind of when you're pulling your list together or, or pulling your range together to have some some depth to it and some interest especially with wines which are not particularly challenging once people have actually stepped over the line and, and tried them um, yeah, it's getting them there, isn't it? That you, you need to do it, and it's the, the engagement and the opportunity just to try and get confidence, and then take your recommendation. And I think, and you, and I think the nice thing about the Alvarosa is it is, you know, Rosso de Montalcino we discussed, and it it might be on people's radar to a degree, but there are very very few people that will have ever heard of Alvarosa. So it, again, it is that opportunity to introduce people uh, to to something brand new. Um, Stefan, we had great plans pre the lockdown. And I still have great plans after the lockdown. The La Luce has obviously worked kind of with you guys already, but it comes in these beautiful magnums. How, how does the uh, La Luce fit with you? Yeah, it's a wine which I list to the normal bottle. I uh, started listening like half a year ago and um, it was sort of, you know, I love discovering things. And I think it's one of the most important things in our life, especially when you work in the world of wine, that, that you try as much as you can. I mean, to a sensible amount, but you know, you expose yourself to something which you haven't heard about. And it's a bit like, I'm actually taking my weakness here because I've never heard about Albarossa before. I mean, neither the less I've tried it before. So when Will approached me and said, can you try this? I was like, yeah, what the heck is this? You know, Albarossa. And now when I see when I see guests in restaurant, they, they ask me, I've heard about Banfi, and I was like, great. I never heard about Albarossa. And my usual answer to this is, neither have I. And I think, you know, I normally make the connection with them like this, saying, you know, I actually I haven't heard about it either, but I think it it's a wonderful, juicy, fresh, approachable style of wine. Um, they may have heard about Nebbiolo or Barbera. They may not like Nebbiolo or Barbera, you know, that quite frequently, but they like Albarossa very much. For me, from a restaurant point of view, this is an ideal wine to serve by the glass. You know, this is like, regardless if this is open half a day or two days, or if you just pop that cork, you know, it's it's always there. You know, you, you pour it and it's right there. And I think, as I said, you know, you need to, need to make this work in your advantage. I've never heard about Albert Osso before. I've tried to find some before, never had the chance. Then I tried and I was like, you know what, it's a jolly good wine. I like it. It's juicy. It's fresh. And it would work very, very good, especially in the later time of the year you know, uh, in autumn. And actually the Magnum bottles, because uh, as we pointed out before, the bottle shape is quite unique. And I think in Magnum, it looks pretty stunning. So it has a visual impact as well. Yeah, I think it's, it's just a great wine. And you know, approaching people from a, you know, a well-known Tuscan house with a slightly uh, yeah, unexpected variety from Piedmont, it kind of again, it's it's one of those things that kind of gets people to stop and think again and 
try through the wines. And I think that's it's great. I love it. Um, now, next up and last up, we've got a wine that can only be described as kitsch. It is just absolutely totally unexpected. Um, Stefan, just to make this a bit more fun for everyone else, Stefan has actually never tried this before. So while we uh, get Igor to talk about it, we'll get Stefan to, well, he's disappeared. He's going to try it. And hopefully we'll all see a big smile on his face. Uh, and if we don't, it's because his camera's turned off. All right, Stefan? Right, you're just trying to get out. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so Igor, please tell us about the Ro Ro Rosa Regale. So Rosa Regale is Brachetto Pure, is a, a native aromatic grape variety from Piedmont. We have a twin estate in Piedmont and uh, the place we, are, we have our winery is exactly in the middle of the Brachetto d'Aqui Appellation. So it's a DOCG from Piedmont, actually very, very ancient. And the only place in the world where Brachetto is cultivated is that place. So in the end it's a super native, Great variety. So once again, we are going back to the roots, and even longer than Nebbiolo and Barbera, we're talking about thousand years ago. So the legend says that uh, Brachetto was the gift from Julius Caesar to Cleopatra in the past. So we're talking about thousand years ago, and it's because he, the, this is probably not a legend. Stefan will confirm is a aphrodisiac, so it is to manage carefully because it's a wine with addiction in it. So... I will, I will confirm tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it, the, the you can order by it, two o'clock if you want next day delivery. <laughs> <laughs> this is, <laughs> actually, this, this should be the, the perfect timing for drinking uh, Rosa Regale out of, out of any, any dining. So, because it's, uh, it's sweet, it's aromatic, it's very light, it's beautiful looking. Is low alcohol, is quite light, is refreshing. So it's just a matter of balance. It's quite foamy and everything is natural. So no addictions, of course. It's just, uh, let's say, uh, Prosecco style, it's char Charmant style winemaking, but low temperature just to preserve aromas because the most important characteristics of the wine, as well as the grape, is aromas. So uh, being an aromatic grape, if you pick just a berry or brocade and you taste, it will taste exactly like the wine. And the wine is usually uh, tasting, is always tasting like rose and like, uh, let's say, slightly uh, strawberry hints. So it's very, very, very lovely. And being only 7% seven, <clears throat> seven alcohol is a wine to get quite easily drunk with because it, you drink tons and tons. I used to say that when I, I have a table to manage in a, in a wine fair or in a... In a and I don't know, in a tasting. And nobody's coming for this wine by the bottle in the beginning because it looks different, actually. But as soon as the first is approaching the wine and trying, there will be a queue asking for trying it again because the, the, the chatting is spreading around the room and everybody wants to come and try it because it's really lovely. So even if you are not a, a, a dessert wine lover, this wine will, will attract you, absolutely. And of course, it's a dessert wine. And why uh, and should it be that lovely also after dinner? Because it's light, because it's helping your digestion. It's not that heavy. You know, if you have a long uh, dinner or, or lunch and you are not, let's say, so well uh, ready for a, a glass of, of dessert wine, this is the wine for you. Just a little sparkling and bubbles helping your digestion, making maybe the first uh, digestive uh, help, just to be polite, and, and then you, you will get easier. So it's a wine really absolutely easy to approach, but with a, an incredible difficult wine making and a very historical route. So looking so fresh and young, but with an, an amazing uh, history and a, a lot of storytelling once again. But the tasting, is probably your best way to succeed. I think uh, your your story about at tastings is is so on point. I I remember being <laughs> at a tasting, and there were these three very well-to-do kind of very wealthy programmers or bankers. I don't even know what they were, 
but they'd kind of gone through trying, you know, your top Brunellos. And then they saw this at the end of the table and they're like, can we, oh God, you know, <laughs> touching each other. Who's going to be the one to try that first? And then one of them tried it and he's just like, guys, you've got to try this. And it was amazing. And they each ordered some afterwards. I'm not sure about the Brunellos, but it, it's a wine that lures you in. Um, so Stefan, I saw you open it. I saw you sniff it. I'm not sure if I've seen I you see. taste it. I, I tried it already. I can I try it officially as well, like uh, stretching. <laughs> oh, that, that's your second glass. Oh, there we go. Not my third, actually, but you don't feel it. <laughs> but I think Igor said it correctly. It's just 7%, you know, so it's like you, you don't really have any re regrets drinking it, you know, but... You know, the way how my mind always works when, when I try uh, wines like this, I instantly think, what can, I, what can I eat with it? What do I pair with it? You know, so, I mean, even if you just want to open chocolate, you know, if you want to have some creamy blue cheese to go with this, uh, any fruit-based dessert, which is raspberry or strawberry jam or something like this, you know, there's, the world is endless pairing-wise. And I think what is very, very good about it, because it's not too sweet. And I eat sweet, but it's not too sweet. And I think this is as well the secret to success for always that, yes. I mean, you saw it in the beginning when it was pouring. I mean, that foam, try to get that foam going again to have a look at it. But you know that it's quite inviting as a drink. And um, there's one very, very important thing to mention here is, and it's the nose. You know, the, the one thing, you know, if something smells good, then the likelihood you're going to give it a try is quite high. And then because... It has this slight effervescence. It's not too sweet and this slight sparkle. You drink it very, very easily. So, I mean, if this cold will be another 20 minutes, you know, watch that bottle. <laughs> um, sorry. Julia, I mean, I know it works well for you. I mean, or your customers, or it has done. I mean, how, what, do you, what do they think when they see it on the shelf? And how do you talk to them about it? Um, initially, they're very surprised that it's a rosé because the colour is just so dark. <laughs> and, you know, sort of current, sort of uh, normal trend is to go ever paler um, with rosé wines. And so, you know, that's the first thing. Is it really a rosé? You know, surely a sparkling red nose is a rosé. And um, I think, you know, when they look at it, oh, it's going to be very full, but it's going to be a bit heavy. It's going, you know, and it, it takes a little bit of persuasion, but you can only persuade by taste. And you can have a bit of fun. I certainly did, you know. There's a, there's a foam and a fizz to it, and it, it's, a, it's a fun wine. Um, it's serious when you taste it, because there's lots of fruit there, it's very fresh. Um, but, you know, um, it's, I, in my mind, it's not one to be sort of taken too seriously. I think it's great at the end of a, a meal or at the end of a tasting, because it does have that freshness, but also a little bit of weight on the palate, and just is a, is a bit of a, you know, a reviver. Um, and yeah, the sweetness is balanced by that sort of thread of acidity that runs through it just to create some like balance. Um, and it's mouth filling. And um, I think when we've offered it for tasting in various um, opportunities and also in a big beer and uh, festival that was held in St. Albans a while ago, um, people were just happy to have a glass and then came back for more. You know, they weren't worried about perhaps what they might be eating uh, with it. Um, just, you know, to have something that was that refreshing and very Moorish, easy was was great, and so you know it's it's just lovely to have a perhaps a, a quality fizz that's actually got a nice sort of you know fun approach to it. Um, yeah, and so that's really where success has come from, I guess. I, I think you're absolutely right. It's it's not one to take too seriously, and it's, and it's one to have fun with. And I think pudding wines, especially. I mean, for me, I find myself. I probably shouldn't say this drinking them less and less um but maybe i'm not going to enough nice dinners but anyway nice but, cheese <laughs> yeah but this is a wine that actually you know you will make space for once you've tried it and you kind of you, you know it's bookending your meal and it's there at the end and you will almost build up to it rather than just kind of grab something out of the cupboard at the end because you fancy another glass um or that's how i feel um right i think now I mean, those were the five wines and I think each had kind of slightly different angles on them. Hopefully kind of the conversation's been fairly interesting. Uh, now I think would be a good opportunity to, for you guys to ask questions to, to any of us really about anything we've discussed, anything else. Um, what we will do, the best way is 
we have the group chat on the right hand side. I say on the right hand side, that's on my right hand side, it could be anywhere on your screens. We have the group chat that you can either ask through or if you turn your video on and wildly just gesticulate or, or, or wave your hands, we, Rebecca will unmute you and you can ask any questions. So, do we have any questions? Anybody? Anybody? No? Kate, you always have a question. Stop smiling. There you go. All right, Rebecca, can you release yeah. Kate? <laughs> it's less a question. It's a, am I on? Am I, am I on? on? Yeah, hi, Kate. I'm on. Okay. Yes, um, it's less a question. It's more of an observation, I suppose, which is that this idea of storytelling is really important. And this making a connection in, in whatever situation you're in, whether it's, whether it's in your, your restaurant or in your shop, but, but just bringing people to the area and having those stories and those little hooks that you can draw people in with is really, really important. One of the questions I wrote while you were talking, Julia, was do you have um, wines open in the shop? So when you were talking about the Rosso de Montalcino, um, you, I think you were saying that you poured it at a wine fair, but do you ha ever have things on tasting or are you prepared when you were talking with your customers um, to open something and give a pour and a taste or um, oh, is that actually, kind of... Yeah, we have quite a few opportunities where we get in front of people and taste actually, but you know, the regular thing is um, our Friday evening and Saturday tasting. So every weekend we have yeah. something there and we plan, you know, sort of a schedule to sort of actually sort of Base, you know um most most of our range and we have you know, involved our loose and the regali um you know etc in those events as well as the wine uh, um it's just the best way to you know sort of introduce people to things you know wine is for sort of tasting and drinking and enjoying so yes we do um not so much just on a, an ad hoc basis but more of a structured basis but then we do an awful lot of tasting with different groups of people as well so you know over yeah. You know, probably a period of a year and we've had two or three opportunities to introduce things like this you know with team take things or just the weekend um getting in front of people so yeah and um similar question to stefan do you have a lot of wines on the list i haven't had the um, great fortune of, of dining at dinner but um uh, of um wines by the glass or are you do you use coravan yeah, that you people i do around 60 wines per the glass give or take so all right. together and uh, then there's the like three, four wines which you do with Cora wine as well. So I don't do an excessive amount on Cora wine because I like to keep them rotating. But I run 60 wines per the glass. So that splits in between white, red, rosé, sweet, fortified, uh, champagne, sparkling wine. Um, so yeah, it's plenty. And for me, the most important thing is, and that's the reason why, uh, I mean, uh, not only a work in restaurants, but the reason why I enjoy so much working in restaurants is because I would only work in a restaurant where I could give guests a try of this because I hate personally committing myself to a full glass uh, of something. So someone serves, I order a glass of Sauvignon Blanc and someone just puts that Sauvignon Blanc in, in front of me and walks away. I hate doing this. For me, it's so important that you try wine, that you give people the opportunity to experience it. And, you know, it's for that reason, it's well important because if they don't like it, you'd be like, well, no harm done, you know, because... I mean, this, this 510 CL, which is served in a, not a big deal, it gives you actually the opportunity to, to give them something which they enjoy afterwards. So you actually have a, it not only improves your problem solving skill, but you actually have a good interaction with the guests. So for me, giving people a try and having a good selection of wines per the glass in different ranges, price ranges, different flavors, aromas, it makes our life really interesting. Yeah, yeah. And I saw whilst um, we were talking, Igor, did you see the question pop up um, about yes. how the vineyards looking. Do you want to answer that? Yes, I, I saw both questions. So the first is if you can use uh, Rosa Regal as an aperitif from, from Maggie, if, uh, if I'm not wrong. And that is a, a very nice question because there are many options about Rosa Regal. So it's a very versatile wine. And it used to be sometimes also an aperitif because being not that sweet or at least resulting not that sweet, you can actually use it as an aperitif. So uh, it depends on what you really like, of course, but it's, um, it can be used as an operative. And I, I would say even more that it's also a, a nice wine to be, let's say, mixed. It, maybe this is evil in the sommelier world, but 
we we did we did experiment uh, some places in the world which is usually in uh, hot climates uh, countries like the Caribbean countries or something where they were using Rosargala as a cocktail with gin with other kind of spirits and it was working a lot so uh, in a kind of a refreshing and very uh, perfume and gin and tonic Rosargala was, was an excellent ingredient actually. And the second about the vineyards, yes, the, the Banff vineyards, luckily in the springtime, uh, they, they're looking quite well now. So because we uh, didn't stop any uh, work in the vineyard, so we can do everything independently on the COVID uh, issue. So they are now all flowering already. So we are not in advance compared with the past, but in a regular situation. And that means that we had a lot of, uh, not a lot, but the correct amount of water, of rain, and at the same time, already a lot of sun. So it's a, it's a very, let's say, normal springtime. So March was both rainy and sunny, which is absolutely March. So uh, potentially, this is a perfect uh, springtime for, for vineyards. So it, everything will depend on the summertime and the peaking season, of course. But uh, the beginning is quite, quite okay. Great. Uh, thanks, Maggie, and thanks, Frederick, for the questions that came on the side. Um, any any other questions that we've got? Ah, oh, Peter, release the dean, Rebecca. There we go. Yeah. Hi, all. Um, yeah, I just had a question for Stefan, really, um, in terms of pricing. Um, which of the five wines that we've seen are you stocking? <coughs> And um, how much do you charge for them? <laughs> so I list uh, Lalus, which is just yeah. here, um, on top of my head, because I haven't been in the restaurant for a few weeks now. I think it's around 69 pounds. So it's on the, uh, I start with around uh, 35 to 37 pounds on my list, depending on it. And I do different markups. Um, there's no real general rule which I apply. You know, the, the big hotel world always gives you sort of a, a target to reach in terms of your markup. Um, I like to be a little bit more flexible. So some things are priced a little bit more affordable and some things a little bit more pricey. Uh, for example, if I have a variety which is not particularly well known, like Albarossa, I would rather price it at a lower range and a lower markup in order to invite people to give it a go. So to give you an idea, to put this a bit in contents, I've got around 900 different bins, so 900 different wines on the list. And out of those 900, give or take 200-ish uh, under, or under 100 or at 100 pounds. So it, it's a quarter of the list, which is sort of giving the opportunity to play around with. Now, the thing is, and I'm maybe in a quite unique situation with this, but as in mind, because it is London, it is Knightsbridge, it is a five-star uh, property, and it's a two Michelin star restaurant. So it's like, it comes with certain strings attached of pricing wines to a certain degree, <laughs> which you simply cannot change, you know, because if, if I'm not pricing them, uh, simply someone else will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's very diplomatically put, Stefan. Um, Great. Um, any other questions? No, I think we're good. Right. Well, thank you, Igor, Stefan, Julia, and everyone else who's called in on this. I think it's been, I, I really enjoyed it, actually. I hope you did as well. I think what's kind of come through from everyone is actually the, the ability to, or, or the need to kind of communicate concisely and clearly with your customers and build the trust with them and then they will kind of allow you into their wine world and introduce new things to them uh, the other thing i think that's come out of it is if this lockdown goes on much longer i'm gonna to have to order some rosa regale and pair it with gin because i think it'll be perfect kind of <laughs> like summer idea. evening right <laughs> um great so on that note i think let's uh let's sign out and um Julia and Stefan, I hope uh, you get to enjoy the wines that have landed with you to kind of do your research. Yeah, we will, thank you. And um, see you later. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Igor, for your expertise and thanks everyone for listening. Much yeah, appreciated. Great to hear from you, Igor. Okay. Thank you, Julia and Stefan. It was an honor to be with you. Great thank fun. you very much. Super. On that note, I'll leave it to Rebecca to turn us all off. Mm -hmm.